Welcome back to the MVPN video series. In today's video, we continue building upon Profile 3 of Rosengieri with BGP AD, enhancing its operation by signaling data MDTs and then switching high bandwidth customer multicast streams onto those data MDTs, also known as selective PMSIs in the BGP MVPN world. Let's begin. In the last video of the series, video 15, we saw how the IPMSI AD route was used to create default MDTs between the PEs. This video is a continuation of that video and builds upon it. Specifically, we are building SPMSIs or data MDTs. Again, there is no change in the actual concept, that of data MDTs, and that was covered in video four of the same MVPN series. If you need a refresher on how data MDTs, now called the SPMSI or the selective PMSI operate, please refer to video four linked down below in the description box. If you recall, on the BGP MDT way of accomplishing the switch over to data MDT, it did so by multicasting the mapping information in a UDP packet on the default MDT. That is no longer the case as we can use the BGP MVPN to accomplish that. Once again, standardization also leads to unification and how it does that is by using the SPMSI AD route, auto discovery, for the SPMSI or the data MDT. Fairly simple. Let's look at the route. RD, already explained in the IPMSI. Next is the CMC source length and address. So customer multicast source, its length and its address. That would be four octets for the length and then C multicast sources IP in our case would be the IP itself. Group length and group ID is along the same lines four octets again because it's IPv4 and then the customer multicast group again four octets because it's IPv4. Finally wrapping things up with a local IP which was also explained in the IPMSI video. More interesting though is the mapping of the PS or mapping of this group to the PSPG which probably you know by now will happen in the PMSI attribute. Let's look at that quickly. No flags for our tail end signal tree, so that's only for head entries. Tunnel type is three, which is the same as IPMSI and translates to the PIM SSM tree. MPLS label, zeroed out, ignored, no need here. Finally, the tunnel ID. Now this is the key and is populated by a PS, so a provider source, and most probably it would be the same as used for the IPMSI. And then finally, a provider group or PG, which would be selected from a range of groups that we are going to configure on the PE. This is going to be dynamic, but that completes the mapping. So along with the NLRI and a combination of the PMSI, that's all of the information needed to map the CSCG flow to the PSPG. Once the route is received by the other MVPN PEs, they can decide to switch over if they are interested in the CSCG traffic that is being mapped. Time to see this in action then. So this demo begins exactly where demo in video 15 left off. We have a functional uh, IPMSI working in this default MDT. And uh, the source at R10 is pinging a multicast destination that has joined uh, on the loopback interface of R9 and we are receiving the pings back. One thing about the pings, the packets are 1400 bytes. Uh, so that just essentially makes them big enough to trigger uh, a large enough rate to switch over to the data MDT. Now, uh, another caveat here is XRV does not do the switch over to data MDT. That's just, I believe, a uh, restriction on the XRV itself. So unless until you have some hardware that is attached to XRV actual line cards, the uh, data MDT transition just doesn't happen. So in our case, though, the source sits behind R4 and R4 is going to be doing the switching. Uh, XRV, however, is able to join an advertised data MDT, so that's not a problem. Because in this case, R4, if you imagine, would advertise the data MDT or the SPMSI, and then XRV or XRV1 would join it. So all we have to do now is to configure it and watch the results. If you need more information on where we are right now, that's video 15, 
how data MDTs work, that's video four, links in the description box below. So let's begin by configuring R1 and I believe it's going to be a very simple command here. So let's say do show run VRF C1. And right now we already have the auto discovery configured. So all we need to do is also enable, uh, select a group for the data MDT and enable the switching to that group. And then this auto discovery here is going to take care of that. Now one is going to be ineffective, but I'm just doing it for completeness sake. So VRF definition C1, address family IPv4, and this would be MDT data. And you would pick a, uh, a multicast group address, which is basically a group of addresses, uh, which you would see because it would be with a uh, subnet mask, so or a wildcard mask rather. So in this case, let's just say 239.1.1.0, and then you have to pick the wildcard bits. So we'll pick 0.0.0.1 .0 .0 or 255, which they work exactly how they work in access list. Care bits are zero, don't care bits are uh, one. So this is basically a 256 addresses long group that we can now use for data MDT switchover. Uh, one more thing here needed is the threshold. So MDT data threshold, and I would keep it as low as possible. So I'll keep it at one. We have to do the exact same thing to R4. And we would do VRF definition C1 address family IPv4, MDT data, and we'll keep this different. We'll keep the groups different in all of them, although that's not needed. It's sort of specific multicast, so you can reuse the groups, but we'll just use different groups. 239.4.4. Actually, I did make a mistake there, so I ended up using 239 where it should have been 232 because I'm using source specific multicast. So let me delete this. And I'll say MDT data 232.1.1.0.0.0.0.255. Because remember, this is what the C multicast traffic is going to get mapped to. So essentially, this here is a P multicast group. So I was forgetting that myself, but that's a P multicast group. We'll do the same thing here. MDT data 232.4.4.0 and 0.0.0.255. So again, another slash. Uh, 24 or 256 addresses. We'll also say MDT data threshold one. And finally, we will configure this on XR1, config T, show run multicast routing. So here again, we'll have to go into multicast routing, VRFC1, and we would say address family IPv4. And now finally, we can say MDT data and we pick something. So this would be 232.21.21.0. And I think it's just a slash 24 here. Also, I can say MDT data threshold. No, I think here the threshold goes in line. So it also goes in line. There is an option in XE to put it in line, but really it doesn't matter because, because XE uh, what they're going to do is they're going to deprecate that. So the way, the proper way to do it allegedly is the way that we did it, which is in separate lines. But in XRV, it is still the old method. Commit. Now, if I am not wrong, this should have already switched over. And for that, R4 should be generating a route. So it should be generating that mapping and that SPMSI route. Let's take a look at it. Do show BGP, IPv4, MVP, and all. And there is that route. It's route number three. So route type one was IPMSI intra area, route two was IPMSI inter area, and then route three was SPMSI. So SPMSI, it's got a route distinguisher, which is 4444 colon 100, same uh, route distinguisher that uh, route type one is also advertised with, or rather this one. Then there is the actual mapping. So not the mapping of the group that is being mapped, the S comma G that is being mapped, not the PSPG, but the CSCG. So the CS in this case is 10, 10, 10, 10, because we are coming from 10. And uh, the group is 239.9.9.9. .9 .9 .9. 
Once again, we can confirm this by going on XR2 and say show BIM topology. And you can see this is the customer group. So basically what R4 is doing is it's mapping that group. And finally, R4 pushes its own address, its well-known address, 4444. So take a look at the slides to see the, uh, the structure of this route. And you would see that this is correct indeed. Now let me say detail and look at that very last route. Because now that we know what is being mapped, we need to know what core tree is it being mapped to. So essentially your PSPG. So once again, the same old PMSI attribute, that hasn't changed. So that's the way we scale. We scale based on that one uh, single attribute that is shared across multiple routes. So all of those are route type ones. This is route type three, but the PMSI attribute hasn't changed. Once again, flags are zero. Tunnel type is three, which is exactly the same as the IPMSI. They're both SSM PIM trees. Uh, the length is eight, which again, I did not see what that length meant, but I believe, yeah, I'm not sure about that, but that's probably the, uh, yeah, let me not say anything about that. But the label here is explicit null. Essentially it is ignored upon receipt. So um, even though it's all zeros, and that would technically mean explicit null, but the label is essentially ignored. And finally, you have the tunnel parameters. That means what is the actual PSPG? So this is the tunnel ID, if you will. And we have to, again, go back from hex. So this is 4.4.4.4. This is 232. So that we remember from up here as well. So all of these are 232. 232.4.4. Dot zero. So essentially we had on this picked do show run include data MDT. The group we had, or is it MDT data? What we have picked was this whole group 232.440. And essentially what R4 did is it picked the very first available address. And there you go. What XR1 now should have done is it should have joined this group because it's receiving the same um, it's receiving the same route. So show BGP IPv4 MVPN. It's receiving that very route. So what it should have done in its show PIM topology is it should have joined. In addition to the IPMSI, it should have joined the SPMSI. Uh, tunnel as well. So it is joining that 4444-232.440. For the most part, the verification is the same verification as we performed in video number four. So there are some commands which are show pim vrfc1 or do show ip pim vrfc1 mdt bgp send. So these are the uh, MDD group 232. So this is the IPMSI, and then this is the SPMSI. I've advertised both. Let me see if there is a detailed version of it. There isn't, but I believe I can do a, without a BGP keyword, I can just say send. And that would show me the actual mapping. So 10, 10, 10, 10, And then this is the group that is matched onto it. Um, again, I don't believe there is an actual. It is mapping the source to, <laughs> but BGP send. I wonder if there is a detailed keyword to do this. But uh, I could be wrong about that history. Nope, that's just the history interval. Send. Hmm. So it, it really actually no, I'm wrong about this. So this is the CSCG. And then this is the PG. And that's essentially what's happening. The PG doesn't have the S there, the PS, because that's implicitly going to be R4's well-known IP. So the 4444 is not listed here, but that's really not needed in this output since we are performing the output on R4. Uh, 
that's about it for data MDTs and how we have basically made the transition to SPMSI. This brings us to the end of this demo. Those were a majority of BGP MVPN routes needed for auto discovery. Up next, we cover the remaining BGP MVPN routes, this time facilitating C multicast signaling. Till then, I'd like to thank you for joining us and urge you to stay tuned for our next video. Thanks. Yeah.